My comments tonight will serve as both the superintendent comments and an introduction to our presentation for this evening. Tonight's meeting will focus exclusively on a single topic, the proposed change in school start time. As you will hear in the presentation, we have listened to a community's request to engage in a conversation regarding the start and dismissal times of our schools. Engaged we did, sending out a survey to our community seeking input, and our community responded. Clearly, there is evidence that this issue is an important one. Parents, students, teachers, staff all shared their thoughts and opinions about what they believe is best. As you can imagine, there are responses across the continuum, from strong opposition to strong support and everywhere in between. As a district, we listened and adjusted where we could. We've committed to arranging for drop-off times to be accommodating and have made daycare needs to be as minimally impacting as possible. Co-curricular programming was taken into consideration, as was busing. The research on sleep time was reviewed. Districts on a similar journey were consulted. Tonight's proposal received the level of study and attention that a change of this level requires. In the end, this proposal is one that for some individuals and some families will require a change in current schedules. For others, there will be enthusiastic support, and still for others, they will be fine. Like most change, should this recommendation be accepted, this will eventually become the way that we start and end schools in Cherry Creek. Adjustments will be made and new routines will be established, and that will be for all involved. This recommendation gave consideration to all 54,700 students in this district who attend 43 elementary schools, 10 middle schools, 7 high schools, and numerous other programs across the entire district. Most important, this recommendation is made based on what we believe is best for learning. Yes, as we listen to all the comments this evening and review the information in tonight's presentation, as well as what's posted on the district's website, tonight's recommendation is based on learning, because that's what we do in schools. We do learning. And with that, Dr. Siegfried, I welcome you to share the presentation this evening. Thank you. President Perlis, Superintendent Bull, members of the Board of Education, appreciate the opportunity to bring this formal recommendation to you this evening regarding the start times for schools. Before I start, however, I want to share just one piece. Usually there are handouts at the beginning of a meeting. Uh, tonight we do not provide that because this information has been online for over 30 days, everything we're going to present tonight. And the presentation is over 103 slides in length, and that would have killed a, a tree per presentation. So it is available online um, and it is the same information that's been available for over the last month. So to begin with, we started this process back in August of 2015 with the community-based Cherry Creek 2021 work. That work resulted in an updated graduation requirement supported by the Board of Education in June of 2016. As a part of the conversation, which had multiple facets to it, was led by our community, we heard strong recommendations to really look at moving the later high school start times to a later time. And that work we took forward into the conversation today. So it really did start quite a while ago, started with our community, and really ended up in this conversation around the purpose of moving this forward or having this conversation was to develop and recommend a school start time schedule that is driven by best practice research on adolescent sleep patterns and is appropriately balanced with family and community needs. And both parts of that sentence are important because if we look at the research, it's pretty clear. It wouldn't be hard. We could have done it yesterday and implemented it. But we also know that we don't live in a vacuum, and so we have to engage our community and have that conversation and look for that appropriate balance as we move forward in a learning organization. The process has been pretty extensive. I will break it down into four parts as we move through the presentation, um, as we've gone through and, and done each of these um, items. First, in 2015 through November 2016, the part I'll talk about now. We did a lot of studying, we looked at the research, we investigated best practice, we went for, looked for a community involvement, and then did a survey. And so I'll go through that before we move to the next stage. We started with the task force, and for over 18 months, these individuals met and had conversations about experience, 
as parents, as educators, best practice, research, every angle that we could think of from the school district it was important to look at. I want to stop real quick and just ask members of the task force that are able to be here tonight, if you could stand up, please. I'd like to thank you and recognize you for your work in this process. You can see that it is from um, all levels of the organization, including Cheryl Cunningham and a number of teachers from uh, different levels of the organization that we'll uh, have a chance to hear from in a bit. And I also want to take a moment just to thank, before I go through this presentation, because much of the work here is done by Jinsey Manfield, my assistant. So if you would stand up and be recognized because the amount of work you did was extraordinary. So thank you all for your effort in this process to get us to a, a great recommendation. So this group really led the process. And I'll talk through each piece, um, many community conversations. I uh, started presenting to our community through very different uh, parent and community organizations last September. First presented to District Pass, and then Parents Council, presented to Leadership Cherry Creek, presented to Parent Information Network, District Accountability, a parent feedback group, which was actually formed after our calendar change, which is a part of this recommendation as well, brought those parents in and we had a conversation around this recommendation. CCSD parent committee chairs. We met with the presidents or chairs of every major committee in the district as represented here. We met again twice with parents council, once in the morning and once in the evening for a presentation to parents. Met with medical advisory board and also presented a long range facility planning committee. Each of these presentations I showed up with a concept, a conversation, and it changed by the end of it. Because as we had all these conversations with community members, we got information, we had a good dialogue, and we adjusted the conversation as we moved forward. For staff engagement, I had the opportunity to speak with the Cherry Creek Education Association, the association reps from each school, and had a great conversation and feedback from them, which led to some different uh, programming plans. Uh, Dr. Bull sent an all staff letter notifying all staff of what was going on and invited them to the survey and faculty forum, which is an opportunity for a representative from every single school in the district to meet with Dr. Bull and senior administration. Best practices, a small group. We had a chance to visit Fairfax County Schools in Virginia, a school district that I'll have more details on later in the presentation, but made part of a change. We had a chance to interact with them and learn from them. Also had a conversation with the superintendent at Wayzata Public Schools in Minnesota, who made a very similar change to what we're recommending. Stakeholder feedback. As you know, we had a community survey open from November 15th to November 25th, and then ongoing community feedback from January 6th to February 1st, of which I'll refer to later in the presentation. Our task force started in 2015, met quite a few times, but most recently started in September, then November, December, and February to kind of guide the conversation. Administratively, met with legal and HR departments, educational operations, met with athletics and activities, uh, administrative council that saw assistant principals, principals, directors, executive directors, and such. Method specifically with elementary, middle school, and high school principals and district athletic directors. Finally then, student feedback. Um, I had a chance, it was probably one of the best parts of this process for me, is I had a chance to go to every single high school and meet with the leadership group. So some of the students you heard from today I had a chance to interact with for over an hour at their school. A group of about 40 to 45 from each high school gave part of the presentation and, and really heard from them and uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear how insightful and informed our students are. So I had a great chance to meet with all of those um, students in the schools. They also were involved in the community survey and community feedback and then finally with the Board of Education through various study sessions, survey updates and this formal presentation and last month's formal presentation have been able to bring the information and keep you in the community informed through this process. So a very extensive process that has many different facets to it. And I'm going to invite Cheryl Cunningham, the president of the Cherry Creek Education Association, to come up and talk about her role and experience with this process. Thank you, Dr. Siegfried. Um, Dr. Siegfried invited me to come tonight to uh, share some information about the process. And I don't know how many of you were in the district when we tried this once before. Some people are nodding. Um, the difference this time is that all stakeholders, um, pretty much all stakeholders, were involved in the conversations from the beginning. Um, our feedback was uh, invited and it was accepted. Um, it was discussed. Um, really and truly, this was a joint effort. Um, it had a much better feel this time because people were listened to. 
The task force got to offer feedback on how the survey would be put together. Um, we got to see the results of the survey and we talked about what the findings were. Um, we continued to have conversations. I've also been invited to be on the implementation team. Um, really and truly, it felt so much better this time, much more collaborative. They really wanted to know what people thought. They continued, even after the survey, to ask for feedback via the website. Um, they still are looking at some things. We're discovering little, little glitches, little things that we're still tweaking. But again, we get to be a part of that conversation. So it's just been a much better feel and a much more collaborative effort this time around, and I truly appreciate um, being invited to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. I appreciate your perspective on that. So then we move on. So we had this group, an incredible process, and we really started with the research on sleep in teenagers. And we looked at quite a, different, quite a few different uh, resources that are out there in the community. This is not a new conversation. Uh, this conversation has been going on for quite a while. There's a lot of research in place on this. But we did our research and really took a look at what is best practice and what has been successful out there and what hasn't worked as well. Um, but what we felt would be most important is to engage with a national expert. So I'd like to invite Dr. Lisa Meltzer to the podium to talk about the research that really is behind this from her perspective as an expert in the field. Uh, Dr. Meltzer is also a Cherry Creek parent and a graduate of the Cherry Creek School District. Thank you so much for having me here tonight and the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm very excited that the Cherry Creek School District is considering this. I've been a sleep professional for 16 years and in the sleep field this is something that we think about quite a lot and across the country people in different districts are thinking about it but the movement is slow for a number of reasons but the science as you'll see is unequivocal so that's what i'm presenting to you tonight is the science behind changing school start times so what we know is that adolescents need eight and a half to nine and a quarter hours of sleep and this is a biological need we know this from a series of studies they did called sleep summer camp where they put teenagers in the basement of a dimly lit house for three weeks same level of light, 24 hours a day. No clocks, no phones, no televisions, right? It was camp, they had fun. For the first week they got to sleep as much as they wanted because being teenagers they were sleep deprived. And then after that they measured how much adolescents were sleeping and when they were sleeping. And this is where we know the biological need comes in for the eight and a half to nine and a quarter hours of sleep. When they were sleeping I'll come back to in a moment. But what we know from national surveys is that across America, our adolescents are averaging seven hours or less sleep per night, which leads to a significant sleep debt. The sleep debt in our country is greater than our financial debt. So, this is what everyone says to me. Sleep doesn't matter. I sleep less than that and do just fine. pie. That's not me, that's the global pie. <laughs> sleep is for slackers, and this is something that our society believes very strongly in and is a great misconception absolutely wrong. You have to breathe. You have to eat. You have to sleep. Sleep deprivation is a known torture technique. Insufficient sleep in animals, we don't do these studies in humans for various obvious reasons, but prolonged sleep deprivation leads to death in animals. You have to sleep, the body will make itself do so. Sleep is essential. A lot of people think sleep is a waste of time. I don't need to sleep. But it's not a passive state, it's very active, our bodies are very busy, and most importantly, our brains are working. So sleep is essential for health, daytime functioning, and well-being. So if you were to go in for an overnight sleep study, you would come out with a picture that looks something like this. The first part of the night is when you're awake and you fall asleep. For most people, it takes somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes to fall asleep, up to 30 minutes is considered normal. In the first few hours of sleep, especially for children and adolescents, they go into their very deepest sleep. And one of the first things that happen is growth hormones released. Yes, children literally grow in their sleep. We also see a lot of brain recovery and brain cleaning during this first period of the night. And executive functioning, those are those things like judgment, mood, reaction time that are very important, are also processed quite a lot and refreshed during sleep, during the first part of sleep. 
In the last part of the night, this red line, this is your REM sleep or your dream sleep. We get most of that dreaming sleep in the last part of the night. And this is where memory consolidation really happens in learning. So there's this great myth, if I stay up all night and study, I'm gonna do great tomorrow. But truth be told, if you study for one to two hours and sleep on it, you'll actually do better because the memories consolidate in the learning forms. Now, if you look across the bottom here, zero to nine hours of sleep is what I've told you is recommended for adolescents. And then I told you most are getting about six to seven hours of sleep. So let's just lop off the last part of that night. What are we losing? We're losing memory consolidation and learning. And since we're here to talk about academics and academic performance, that's pretty crucial. So now let's go back to sort of the science behind sleep. So I got technical terms, but really the simple story behind it. So sleep homeostasis. Homeostasis is a balance. We like to be balanced in life, right? You don't want to be too hungry. You don't want to be too full. Same thing, you don't want to be too sleepy and you don't want to be too wakeful. After a full night of sleep, you've relieved your sleep pressure. The higher it goes on the graph, the more sleep pressure you have. So in theory, 7 a.m., you wake up, you've had a refreshing night of sleep, and you don't have pressure for sleep. As the day goes on, that pressure builds. Every hour that you're awake, you are sleepier than you were the hour before. By the end of tonight's board meeting, you will all be sleepier than when you entered. It has nothing to do with the content. Right? So this is what happens. In adults, we are awake for 16 hours before our body is ready for sleeping. That's this threshold here. And in children and adolescents, that threshold can be anywhere from 12 to 15 hours. Now, everybody pushes through that threshold. We've all done it at some point or another. We cross through the threshold and we stay awake. We can do it. There's no problem with that. We drink caffeine, we keep ourselves going. The problem is, is that after you cross this threshold, functioning deteriorates. Mood, reaction time, performance, that ability to do your homework, that ability to be patient with your children, all of those things fall apart. And again, we know this from studies where they've kept people awake in every hour they measure their functioning, and that's that point where we see functioning deteriorate. So our students who are staying awake longer than they should be, again, resulting in um, potential academic performance deficits. So again, they go to sleep, they relieve the sleep pressure, and they start the day over again. Now, everyone says, well, if they just turn off their phones and went to bed earlier, they wouldn't have any problems waking up, right? We've all thought that, just shut down the technology, stop, get off of Facebook. The problem is, is we have this thing called a circadian rhythm. It's an internal clock. Everyone has it. You notice it especially when daylight saving time changes, which is coming up in early March, right? We're springing forward. We lose an hour of sleep. It's brutal. Yeah, I see a lot of sneers in the comments. <laughs> okay, so our internal clocks run on about a 24.2 hour day. Anyone catch what was wrong with that sentence? 24.2, right? The Earth revolves in 24 hours. So why that's important is because we are constantly working to keep our internal clocks on the right schedule. It also allows us to adjust our internal clocks if we travel across time zones or daylight saving time. So we have these internal clocks, and what they're most controlled by, besides routines, meals, schedules, is the light-dark cycle. So when it gets dark in the late afternoon and the early evening, that darkness goes through the eyes to the brain and says, make melatonin. Melatonin is a naturally produced hormone that doesn't make you sleepy at that moment, but prepares your body for sleeping in a couple of hours. So you have this melatonin, and in a few hours you go to sleep. Melatonin continues to be released overnight. In the morning, we open our eyes to bright Colorado sunshine, and that light suppresses melatonin. So light keeps your brain from making melatonin. When we often talk about limiting light exposure, especially from technology in the evenings, this is one of the reasons why too much light exposure at night can make it more difficult for sleeping. Now, back to the teenagers, it's not just the light from the technology, however. At Sleep Summer Camp, they had these teens give melatonin samples every 30 minutes to measure what time their melatonin was released. And again, there was no light-dark cycle. There were no clock cues. It was just a natural physiological release of melatonin. And this red line here shows you where an adolescent's circadian rhythm looks like. So again, late afternoon, my melatonin's being released. And here are adolescents at their peak of wakefulness. And then they go through the night, and here at 7 a.m., they're at the peak of sleepiness. And 7, 10 a.m. is the time we ask our students to be in a classroom, learning and engaging. And even before 7, 10 a.m., we're asking many of our students to get behind the wheel of a car and drive to school, students who are not experienced and don't have great reaction time and judgment to begin with, adding on top of it sleep deprivation and a sleepy brain. 
So I'd like to present to you some of my favorite faces of deficient sleep. You've all met them. They live in your house at one time or another. You have sleepy, you have dopey, and you have grumpy. Right. This is what happens when children and adolescents don't get enough sleep. And again, the science clearly shows this. You see significant changes to mood and to affect. Moody teenagers, part of the reason they're moody, again, is just simply not getting enough sleep. We have studies where they've taken children, healthy, normal children, had them go to bed one hour later for five nights. And at the end of the week, their teachers are now rating them as if they have ADHD in terms of difficulties paying attention and difficulties with mood regulation. So we can create behavior problems in children by sleep depriving them. We also see risk-taking behaviors and in increased accidents, especially in adolescents who are not getting enough sleep. We see neurocognitive deficits. So again, in a similar study in Israel, they had these students go to bed one hour later for three to four nights, and at the end, and the other half of the group went to bed one hour earlier for three to four nights. On average, students were getting an extra 30 minutes of sleep or getting 30 minutes less sleep than they usually did. Three to four nights, 30 minutes a night. By the end of the week, these two groups were now performing at a grade level different in terms of things like reaction time, math processing speed, short-term memory, all of those things our students need to have in a classroom to be successful. And we also now have direct evidence showing weight gain. And this is from preschoolers, school-age children, adolescents, and into adults. If we have you go to bed slightly later, or if we have you stay up past your normal bedtime, you will consume extra calories. And it's not apples and carrots. It's cookies and potato chips. So adolescents, when asked to spend only six and a half hours in bed for five nights, consume an extra 170 plus calories per day. You add that up over the course of a school year, and we are now seeing direct links between insufficient sleep and obesity. Now how can you tell that somebody's not getting enough sleep? There's individual sleep needs. Everyone in this room needs somewhere in the range of seven to eight, maybe even nine hours of sleep. Some of you may need six hours, you're probably on the far end. You can get by on six hours, but you don't need it. So how can you tell when somebody is getting enough or not enough sleep? If you have to wake a child in the morning or a teenager in the morning, and I mean really wake them, and I'm using this example before somebody even told me recently they did this, I mean like throwing water on your child to get them out of bed, that's extreme. That means your child has not gotten enough sleep. You should be able to wake your child, and within 15 minutes, they should be up and out of bed. They may not be pleasant. I can't guarantee that. <laughs> not everyone's a morning person. But they should be able to be able to get up and get moving. If your student is sleeping two or more extra hours on the weekend than they are on the weekdays, that's a sign of insufficient sleep. That's a sign that they are trying to pay down their sleep debt and catch up on the lost sleep that they've had throughout the week. If they fall asleep in school, Students should not fall asleep in school, ages K through 12. And we see a lot of students falling asleep in school. Again, a strong sign of insufficient sleep. Other inappropriate times, sporting events, birthday parties, family outings. Kids should sleep when it is the correct sleeping time. Finally, fill in the blank. Parents, every parent in this room, following a night of my child not getting enough sleep or poor quality sleep, the next day my child is cranky. Grumpy, incorrigible, right? Younger children, hyperactive, they get wound up. My son used to do laps around the house at bedtime. And people would say to me, Lisa, he's not tired. I'm like, are you kidding me? He's running to keep himself awake. Yeah? So we see a lot of changes in children when they don't get enough sleep. And they're pretty obvious to parents. Now there's a number of reasons beyond school start times, although that you will see is one of them. Technology is one of our greatest sleep stealers. Remember I talked about 30 minutes extra sleep a night or 30 minutes lost sleep per night? Children and teenagers with technology in the bedroom sleep on average 30 minutes less than teenagers without technology in the bedroom. Even if they're not using it at bedtime, the presence of technology in the bedroom leads to 30 minutes less sleep per night. Caffeine, it's widely available. You can get it in the obvious suspects. You can also get caffeine in water. You can get it in candy bars. You can get it in maple syrup. Right? So students have access to a lot of caffeine, and when they are using it, especially in the late afternoon and evening to get their homework done, again, they're trying to fuel themselves. The problem is caffeine has a half-life of about four to six hours, which means four to six hours after you drink it, it should still be buzzing in your brain, 
So if you can drink that coffee right before bed and fall right to sleep, you either have a very high tolerance to caffeine or you're extremely sleep deprived. The only way to tell the difference is to take yourself off of caffeine for two weeks, then drink that cup of coffee at bedtime and see how the night goes, right? And you can just really quickly tell. And then of course, school, early school start times has been one of a great sleep stealers. All right, so there's a number of studies that have looked at changing school start times and what they find. Students get more than eight hours of sleep. That's where we see the biggest change. We see better academic outcomes, better attendance rates, higher graduation rates, reduced tardiness, less depression, less caffeine use, and fewer car crashes. So our students are getting to school safer, they're learning better, and they're performing and feeling better throughout the day. Fayette County, Kentucky was one of the school districts that did this on an early side and, and uh, published some very interesting data. They started their school one hour later from either 7.30 to 8 or 8 to 9 a.m. So again, you see this increased total sleep time. The percent of students getting more than eight hours of sleep went from about a third to half of the students. You can see that sleep decreases across grades. That's just very common across every study you see. What they also found was 16.5% decrease in the number of motor vehicle crashes. So this top line here is the county where the changes were made, and the bottom line is the state. So across the state, there was no significant drop. So it wasn't as if there were more signs or things. It was this county where school start times were changed. What they did not find changes to, the number of hours spent on homework, the number of hours students spent working, or the number of sports or activities they participated in. So it did not impact all of those extracurricular things that we still want our students to be involved with that makes them the round whole person. So here in Colorado, a couple of high schools did, were part of a larger uh, study that looked at this as well. Fairview High School moved from 7.35 to 8.05. They went from a third to just over 40% of their students getting more than eight hours of sleep. Their tardies decreased, the overall GPA increased, and this was most notable in their first period class for 11th and 12th graders. They increased GPA in that class by 0.2 to 0.3. That's not small. Any student who's tried to get their GPA up by the 11th or 12th grade, that's a big change. Boulder High School also made the change from 7.30 to 8. They had a late start on Wednesdays. Again, you see that 42.5% of students getting more than eight hours of sleep, decreased number of tardies, GPA went up, and so you just see this big picture of the benefits. Now, everybody says, but my child will just stay up later. You give them a later start time, they're going to stay up later, they're going to do more fun things. And the truth of the matter is they don't stay up later. So this is two different studies. The blue was one study, pre and post, and the green was another study. And across high school, and what you see is that students don't stay up later. In fact, in this first study, they actually went to bed earlier. Right? And what you find is that the increased sleep duration comes solely from increased sleep time in the morning. We also looked at a study of homeschool students who were waking at the same time that public school students were starting. This led to a cumulative sleep debt. So in this graph, you can see how much sleep they're getting day by day. The lighter bar is the, is the homeschool students. So you can see by the end of the week, they're getting more sleep. 49 minutes a day adds up to four hours a week. Over the course of a school year, it's 144 hours. It's a simple math problem. But what this line is showing you that on the weekends, everybody does oversleep, right? So the public and private school students, they're not making up this four hour difference every week by oversleeping on the weekends. So that sleep debt continues to build and takes a significant toll on our students. Now sports, that's a big objection across the country for changing start times. And of course, we've heard that it's great success of our students at Cherry, uh, throughout the Cherry Creek District next year. Wilton, Connecticut changed their start times. There was strong opposition from coaches who really felt like this was going to the be all end all of their sports program. Next year, the high school had the best season ever. They won several state championships. They had increased extracurricular participation across all grades. In Stanford, they did a number of very interesting studies where they asked high-level athletes to increase their sleep time in bed to 10 hours per night. What they found for basketball players, they had a faster sprint, their free throws were more accurate, and the players themselves reported improved mood and decreased fatigue. In football, the 20-yard shuttle went from 4.7 to 4.6 seconds. The 40-yard dash improved from 4.9 to 4.8 seconds. And in swimming, the 15-meter sprint, 0.5 seconds faster. They reacted 0.15 seconds quicker off the blocks, 
improve turn time by 0.01 second. Again, this seems like very small unless you are heavily involved in the world of swimming or if you watch the Olympics and Michael Phelps who won his gold medal by 0.01 second. The smallest difference can make a big change in outcomes. All right, so now I know there's a group of people, oops, battery pack came off. I'm one of them because I have a first grader, yes? So what about our elementary school students? I've talked very heavily about our middle and high school students. We know the science is unequivocal. They need to start later. Won't starting earlier cause them to get less sleep? There is not as much science in this area. There was a group of schools in the Northeast that changed. The third graders went from 9.10 to 7.45. The fourth and fifth graders went from 8.20 to 7.45. Similar to what we found in the high school studies, they reported that they wake time, yes, uh, sorry, it's opposite of what we found in the high schools. So the wake times were definitely earlier in the fourth and fifth graders, but were later in the third graders. What you really see the difference is, is bedtimes. Bedtimes were adjusted. When schools started earlier, bedtimes were earlier. Okay, and so this is the, the difference that we see. And a National Sleep Foundation has data from across their country. And what you find, again, is students who start schools later, go to bed later, and wake up later. Oh, oops, I didn't mean to do that, there we go. And what that means is total sleep time difference. So in third graders, they actually increase their sleep duration. There was a small change in fourth and fifth graders, less four minutes and less nine minutes per night. Now, why can elementary school students go to bed earlier? We just talked about this circadian rhythm. And the reason why is that shift doesn't occur until puberty. So here we have some melatonin release data that from ages nine to 13. And you can see melatonin is released at a very similar time between 9 and 11 age, years of age. But between 11 and 13, you see this, in, or this much later release of the melatonin. And so this is that point in middle school where they can't just fall asleep earlier, even if they go to bed earlier. Similarly, self-reported circadian rhythm, like how many of you are morning larks versus night owls, right? There's this preference for when you're most awake and alert. And the self-reported preference, you see a big change from a morning preference to an evening preference between the ages of 12 and 13. So we see that elementary school age students are able to adapt their sleep schedules. And in terms of academic performance, there is one study that came out of Kentucky. Their conclusion, in quotes, earlier school start times can be associated with poor school performance in elementary schools. And the reason why I emphasize this is they didn't look at a number of other factors that we've talked about. They didn't look at bedtimes, wake times, actual sleep duration, extracurricular activities, technology use, technology presence in the bedroom. And one of the authors who I've colleagues with, I've communicated with him saying, I have this study, what do I do with it? He said, Lisa, correlation does not equal causation. This showed an association. It does not show that this academic performance in elementary school children is caused by start times. So to better explain this, there's a great website out there with spurious correlations. The divorce rate in Maine correlates quite strongly with the per capita consumption of margarine. I don't think the divorce rate changed margarine cap consumption or vice versa. If you're not convinced though, per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese is also correlated with the number of civil engineering doctorates awarded. Okay? Now I'm not saying necessarily that it's a spurious correlation in the Kentucky study, but I'm saying it's one study that must be interpreted very cautiously. So going back to those actual studies that were sleep manipulation, remember we asked students to go to bed later or earlier, let me show you how much sleep the students were getting. Baseline, 8.7 and 9.3 hours. When they extended, they're getting up to that 10 hour range. We know the recommended sleep for elementary school age children is 9 to 11 hours. Extended 9.2. The restricted is down to 8 and 8.4 hours, which is below the recommended amount of sleep for elementary school age children. So if you're looking at a nine hour sleep opportunity at a minimum, and your child needs to wake up at 6 a.m. for an 8 a.m. start time, you're talking about a 9 p.m. bedtime. 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. gives you nine hours. 6 a.m. may be early to wake up for an 8 a.m. start time. 9 p.m. may be late for many elementary school age children to go to bed. It's gonna revolve an adjustment in terms of schedules, but it is feasible. Finally, the Minneapolis School District was the first large district in the country to make changes. They did focus groups with their teachers, and this was the outcome for the elementary schools that changed from 840 to 740. They felt students were more alert at the start of the day and remained 
energized throughout the day. Students had fewer morning transitions and were more ready to learn. Teachers and students were more patient and productive in the afternoon. They had fewer behavior problems and increased participation in school activities. Most notably, they said they loved that the buses were on time, dropping their students off and picking them up. So if sleep doesn't serve an absolutely vital function, then it's the greatest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Meltzer. I, I, I appreciate you being here and um, giving the, the science behind this. So then moving from the science behind this and all the process we've gone to, a few best practice examples that uh, we, we investigated in Cherry Creek. First, Fairfax County Schools. So just a little bit about Fairfax. Very large district, 186,000 students in Virginia. You can see kind of how the makeup of their students and staff. They ended up switching their high schools and middle schools, putting the middle school earlier and the high school later, and then the um, elementary kind of all over the place. What we learned as we had conversations with Fairfax is that they really believe it makes a difference, worth the effort, right thing to do, and then recommend that we make it a complete shift. As I said, they moved their high school later by placing their middle schools earlier. And now they're receiving pressure from their uh, board and from the community around completing the shift and moving the rest of the adolescents later in middle school and elementary earlier. And they're working on that currently. They really focused on quality versus quantity when it came to things like instructional time, one or two more minutes per class period versus the quality and sleeping in and getting good rest. Also with sports practice, maybe not a two and a half hour practice, but a two hour practice where students are rested. Uh, no single schedule meets everybody's needs, as we know. Manage the politics of change. It was the adult swim leagues in their county that um, caused the half change that now they're working on. Utilize civil twilight for start and end times. That was something that uh, they did that we hadn't considered. And communication through implementation is critical. And they also, in Fairfax County, combined transportation for some students grades 6 through 12, which provided them a significant more opportunity to adjust their schedules. Also, as I shared, I had a conversation with the superintendent in Wayzata Public Schools, who is in the first year of making this change. Neighboring districts, Minnetonka and Edina, have also implemented these changes at the current time. You can see it's a little bit smaller school district, but the makeup of the students and uh, where they fall. They made the complete change that we're talking about. Move their elementary students to 7.45 a.m. start, dismiss at 2.25. High school in the second tier, 8.20 to 3.10 and middle school in the third tier, 9, 10 to 4 o'clock dismissal. So that's what they have implemented this year. Talking with the superintendent, he shared that the change from him was based on the medical evidence. If you look at some of the researchers that we looked at, uh, the University of Minnesota is a, a stronghold for a lot of this work. It's been good for them. At the elementary, they did have a lot of conversations. They found that a lot of kids were up were early and ready to go, and parents struggled a bit more in some cases. Middle school, loss of some coaches, but replaced by others at the elementary level. Athletics started later. Um, they opened schools earlier, such as our recommendation will be for the middle schools to open it an hour early for parents to drop off students. Uh, some students have lunch right after arrival. We have that in some instances now. It'll just change who that affects or what level that affects. High schools, um, he found, and this is his uh, own anecdotal evidence, um, is that he found that his, uh, well, I won't, say who, but he found somebody who was less crabby in the morning and actually eating breakfast before school. Uh, they also created a new child psychology class to support aftercare needs, and that's something that we'll have to investigate as well because we count on all of our high school students to provide supervision through our uh, elementary daycare. They found a way around it that um, I believe could be successful for us. They also found that their transportation system was, has been more efficient than ever with elementary earlier, and I'll talk about the reasoning behind that later in the presentation. I also want to talk a little bit about historical practice, because it was mentioned earlier by Ms. Cunningham about where we've been. It's important to be, understand where we've been and why we're there to know how we're and why we're moving forward. In 2000 through 2007, and potentially earlier than 2000, uh, this is the schedule that our, high, our schools ran. Daily schedule for high school, 720 to 745, 240 to 305, middle school, 730 to 8 o'clock start, elementary school between an 8 and 9 a.m. start. And you can see the length of the day was very different at all levels. High schools ranges from six hours and seven hours and 16 minutes to seven hours and 24 minutes. Middle school, six hours and 50 minutes to seven hours and eight minutes. And elementary school was in anywhere between six and a half hours to seven hours. And so we had a lot of schools all over the place and the length of the days were in various different places. But I do want to point out that we did have 
a elementary start time that was at 8 o'clock for many years that worked very successfully. In fact, as I talked with all the students at the high schools over the last months, I asked them who went to elementary school and the middle school in Cherry Creek. Ones that raised their hand, I asked them what time they went to school at elementary, and it was 8 o'clock. In 2007, daylight saving change, a significant change in the daylight saving times law at that time, uh, for reasons of looking at the length of the day and instructional time alignment, there was a change in the start time of schools in the Cherry Creek School District. So between 2000 and 2010, for high school, the day moved a little bit from 7.10 to 7.45, but it was really the hours from 7 hours and 20 minutes to 7 hours and 40 minutes in length that was increased. Middle school day went from 8.25 a.m. to 3.35 a.m., very close to the recommendation we're making this evening as a dismissal time. Length of day was a common 7 hours and 10 minutes. And elementary school started at 8 o'clock and went dismissed between 2.30 and 2.45. And the difference there is because the longer day for four track, which have fewer school days in the year. Then in 2010, the most recent change was really driven by the recession. And we held a number of large community-based meetings to elicit feedback. And at this time, it wasn't only about the change in start times, it was about reduction of transportation services to a, a number of uh, families in the community. So that change led us to where we are today which is really this high school 7 to a.m. start between a 2.30 and 2.51 dismissal. That's because of the length of days at high school is currently varies, but the start time is common. Middle school, it's the opposite. Varied start times, but a common length between 7.50 and 8.10 a.m., 2.50 to 3.10 dismissal, and elementary is currently 9 to 3.30 for most. Uh, length of the school day, you can see there, between 7 hours and 20 minutes and 7 hours and 40 minutes. The average is 7.32. Middle school is a 7 hours across the board. Elementary school is six and a half hours again, unless you're the exception in our four track school. So this is our current status and how we got to this place. Then, with all of this information, all the research, all the process, all the conversation, we put a survey out to our community. The survey was developed by the task force and reviewed by the district accountability committee. We utilized Survey Monkey, 12 questions designed to elicit tolerance and preference. There weren't models that were put out with an ability to vote. It was, what are your preferences within this range? The process to send the survey out, we sent a connect ed message on November 14th to every household using the number that parents put into our system to send that call out. Uh, directing them to the next day, we would send an email. So on November 15th, we sent an email to every household, again, using the email that was given to us as parents registered their children at the beginning of each school year. So we sent that to all households, PK 12 in the district. We sent the email to all school-based staff, and that's so everybody that physically works in a school building received the opportunity to engage, and to all students, 8th through 12th grade. The survey closed on Friday, November 25th. It was open for 10 days, and we used Tableau in our Department of Assessment Evaluation to analyze the results. <laughs> so the results that we received, 25,574 responses, students 8488, staff 3224, and parent guardian 12,862. You can see how many individuals were invited through the process I just described and the response rate. Anytime you get over a well, 33 to a 45% response rate is significant in, in, uh, in this response. So how did some of the responses turn out? Second question, uh, level of school they represent. So you see as I present this information, I'll also have a number of pie charts. The blue represents parent responses, the red student responses, and the orange staff responses. So you can see a majority, 14,000 at the high school, 8,000 at the middle school, 7,400 at elementary school. Looking primarily at parents to begin with, 6,929 parents were high school, 5,428 middle school, and 6,582 elementary parents responded. Looking at feeder area represented, you can see again numbers and then the breakdown. What I really look at here is a correlation or proportionality to the size of the feeder area. Cherry Creek High School is our by far largest feeder area, largest school, and so we have the largest number of results. I would expect that. Then Cherokee Trail is our next largest school and feeder area. They have the next number of results. And the Hillcrest and Grandview are very similar. Overland and Smoky Hill are our smaller two high schools. Endeavor in the middle only has 284 students, so a response of 140 is still significant. And so this really tells me we have good proportional response rate across the district. So, first question, how important is this issue? You can see here, very important, 13,020, relatively important, 5651, and neutral, 
2831, you can see how they break out parents, students, and staff. Uh, this is really 73% of respondents said this is very important or relatively important, something we ought to take a look at. If I break this down by group, so parent by level, so the top group is elementary parents, middle group is high school parents, and the bottom is middle school parents, you can see the trend is the same. Uh, regardless of level, parents across elementary, middle school, and high school believe this was an important issue that we address. <coughs> Slicing the data by staff by level, the top group elementary staff member, then high school staff members, then middle school staff members. And you can see again, the trend is consistent throughout all groups. <coughs> Ideal high school start times. This is the first question that we asked and we gave based on the length of the school day was unknown at seven and a half hours. We could set a start time and know the end time. Presented this to the uh, respondents, and you can see how the responses came out. Now, as I had a chance to talk with those over 500 high school students, what I came to understand is that this was answered really by our students based on what time they got out of school. It became much more response rate of the end time, 3.15, 3.30, 3.45, 4 o'clock, thinking about what they needed to do the rest of the day as opposed to the start time. Because every student I talked to would prefer the 9 a.m. to the 3.15 schedule if that were an option. <laughs> what this gives me is a good range of opportunity to act. But you can see the majority of respondents 8 to 3.30 p.m. as a day, but a good um, oh, nearly 10,000 responses later than 3.30 would be reasonable. Again, slice this by level, parent by level, elementary top, high school in the middle, middle school in the bottom. You can see the same trend follows throughout regardless of how you slice the data. Same thing by the staff by level. Elementary staff, high school staff, and then middle school staff. You see the same trend, except for there are middle school staff talking about high school colleagues um, getting out at 3.30. That was the only group that was a little, little bit different except for the high schools themselves as well. So very similar trends throughout. Um, the top two receive the most support. Going on to question six, latest reasonable dismissal time for middle schools. This data I found interesting. It was a little bit, it's not what I would expected going into this. Uh, really, I, I expected, I guess, the 10,471 at 345, but I wasn't, I was surprised by the 5,000 people that said four o'clock was reasonable and the 3,500 that felt that 410 was reasonable. I did not expect that, and I did not expect to see the gap, the jump over 350 and 355, and then a jump over 405. And as I've talked to groups, I've, I've asked them, I, I think it's because when you think of a clock, it's when the big hands to the side, it makes sense. When the big hands up, it makes sense. And when the big hands back to the side, it makes sense. But when it's in these little increments in the middle, it doesn't make as much sense. Um, so I'm going with that because that's the only thing I can think of. Uh, but you can see, again, a good range of responses that really provides us an opportunity to adjust um, or to act in ways that maybe we didn't think we could. Again, slicing this a little deeper, parent by level, the top group elementary, then high school, and then middle school. And you can see that regardless of level, first, second, third, first, second, third, first, second, third. So the data, regardless of how you slice the data, top preference, second preference, third preference. Same fallout for staff. Top preference, second preference, third preference. And you can see how it lays out at each level. So the trend remains regardless of how you slice the data. Latest reasonable dismissal times for elementary school, same numbers provided, and the same interesting trend. Um, more parents moved down. This was 4,900, now it's 5,500. This was under 4,000, now it's 4,200. And so there are more support later in the day for dismissal. But again, regardless of how you slice this data, first, second, third, first, second, third, by staff, first, second, third, first, second, third. And so you know, regardless of how you slice the data, you end up with the same trend of support for those different times. Then move into, is it okay to change the order that schools start from current? So would it be okay to move elementary first? Would it be okay to move middle school last? And you can see the overwhelming support for yes. It's okay to change the order and put elementary first, middle school last, or middle school first, or elementary school in the middle. However it needs to be, it is okay to change the order of schools. That was overwhelmingly supported by parents, students, and staff. Is it important that secondary students dismiss first to provide supervision to younger siblings? And you can see this is related to the last question and ended up a little differently. That yes, it is important that secondary students dismiss first, but you look a little deeper at the pie charts, you see that there are more parents that say, no, it's not important. 
There are more staff that say, no, it's not as important. Yes, the numbers are tight, but it's the students. 2,000 students said no, 6,500 students say yes. And so it was the students that completely swung this where the parents and the caretakers are pretty split on this. And uh, even after asking the students, I, we, don't have them, no, we don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> a few other questions. Uh, and digging a little deep here. Is it important that older siblings dismiss earlier than elementary siblings to provide daycare? And you can see, so this is parent by level. And so that trend holds uh, the no's, yes versus no, yes versus no, yes versus no. So there's more support for no, it's not as necessary. Um, staff, elementary teachers, middle school staff, high school staff and middle school staff. So you can see that common trend as I explained um, when we take the students out of that data. Would you support changing the length of the middle school by up to 20 minutes? So a uh, parent guardian, staff member, student, you can see the overwhelming support for um, changing the length, increasing or decreasing the middle school day by up to 20 minutes. Second, would you support increasing the length of the elementary school day by up to 15 minutes? So parent, staff member, student, um, overwhelming support in all three categories for increasing the elementary day by up to 15 minutes. Do you support the recommended adjustment to the calendar that coincides with this change? And I'll provide more detail around this change later in the presentation, um, but yes, and I did have, as I talked to kids too, this, this change results in one less day of pupil contact time, and so I asked which of the 2,700 students that argued with that, and actually, I was very impressed by how insightful some of our students are talking about some of their AP and IB exams, um, and, and that was a little bit of thought there, but overwhelming support for the adjustment to the calendar that I'll get to later. I did receive some questions of, there was no chance for me to say I didn't want to change. And uh, their last question in the survey was an open comment. What else do you want us to hear that's important enough that uh, we either didn't ask it or that you needed to um, expand on it? And this is where, as you can see, and I have it highlighted, 564 individuals responded that they wanted the status quo. They want to keep the current schedule as is. And so there was that opportunity in the survey to provide that feedback. And you can see the rest of the comments and kind of how they stacked up, some of the trends that came through, really concerns about the sleep and mental health of our students not getting sleep, concerns about the impact on athletics activities, and you can see the third kind of question around daycare and siblings, 27 people felt strong enough to actually make it a comment, and then 95 people around the calendar. Additional comments that will become some of our future work, really questions around the homework, concerns with how much is given, length of block classes in our block schools. Um, off periods during the day for high school and how they're utilized. Wednesday late start, everybody likes those. Uh, better grades is what the assumption is, and traffic issues. And so those are some of the, again, additional comments that came to this survey that will lead some of our future work as we move forward. So everything up until this point led to the conversation here between December 2016 and February 2017, when we then developed the model, and we publicized it, and we asked for feedback. That process started on January 9th, where we put a draft recommendation to our community. This was the draft recommendation put to our community. Elementary school, 755 to 240. High school, 815 to 330. And middle school, 850 to 345. <coughs> we asked for feedback in the following way. We sent a connect ed message again to every number that was provided to us by families. On Tuesday, January 10th, 2017, to all households. Um, we sent an all staff email on January 10th, pointing them to this direction. On that district website, we posted draft recommendation, the overview of our process, all the disaggregated data, the research we utilized, the results of the survey, and the proposed calendar change. We were completely transparent with every bit of information that we received. That survey closed on February 3rd, 2017. It was open for 25 days. What that data shows us up until the 3rd of February is that we had 36,790 visits to the Start Time website, 29,857 unique visits. Individuals stayed for an average of four minutes and 27 seconds. That tells me they engaged with the material. Out of 36,790 individuals, 2,332 provided feedback. This feedback was publicly posted last week, uh, Monday, February 6th, for the community to see. So every comment that was put in by any community member is now posted publicly. We did remove any names or inappropriate language, but it's posted publicly as you have it now. <laughs> Some of the trends in the questions, concerns, and feedback. Uh, questions and concerns around elementary start and end times to being too early, 
high school dismissal too late? What will middle school students do before school starts? Impact on sports, jobs, after school routines, homework is too much with later dismissal times to stay up later, changes in the family routine and daycare, support, um, aligns with research and best practices, support for high school start and dismissal times, and support for elementary start and dismissal times. So then we took all of that information from the last 25 days, we further refined our recommendation, and we'll provide that final re recommendation now, and that will be publicly posted for the next month prior to the March decision that we will present to the Board of Education, or opportunity to make a decision for the Board of Education. So based on our initial research, best practices, community survey, and the community feedback, this is the final recommendation we are making to the Board of Education tonight. That elementary school will start at 8 a.m. and dismiss at 2.45 p.m. High school will start at 8.20 a.m. and dismiss at 3.30 p.m. And middle school will start at 8.50 a.m. and dismiss at 3.45 p.m. I worked through this model this order aligns with support that was provided through the survey to adjust the order in which schools started. The 8, 820, and 850 aligns with best practice research on adolescent sleep. The 3.30 p.m. dismissal time for high school aligns with the greatest support for latest dismissal at high school level. And the 3.45 p.m. aligns with where the greatest support was for later dismissal at question six. And nearly 13,500 supported a later than 3.45 dismissal time. I believe with this model, we have exceeded the expectations put forth in the survey and the feedback from the community. If I look a little closer at this, um, we talk about the gaps between the start times. That's a, a model or a need for our transportation model because we do not have the funds to not run a staggered system. We have to run a staggered system, and that's why that gap is important. As we learned from the Wazada Public Schools and what our modeling shows us, that with having elementary first, we have a great opportunity to be successful with our youngest students. What this means is that starting first and getting picked up first, every single bus and driver is required to run our elementary routes. When they're first, nobody gets stuck, nobody gets behind through running the other routes. And so we'll always plan to be on time at that 8 a.m. and at the 2.45 dismissal, we'll be on time for that. Well, right now, elementary is a third, so a lot of our elementary students experience late buses um, due to our modeling. The 8 o'clock a.m. moves us out further of that sunrise sunset time. There are a number of days, a couple, a handful of days later in the year where sunrise is as late as 7.30, 7.34 in the morning. Um, and so we'll have about two days uh, later in the year um, that that will be something we'll look into and talk about. And then in the afternoon, the 15 minute gap, we had a lot of conversations around could we run a 340 dismissal at the middle school? And if we ran a 340 dismissal, I would also have to stand up here and tell you that we would be late with transportation. And so we determined the best recommendation for success was to make that a 345 dismissal and tell you that we could be on time with it. This is a budget neutral recommendation moving forward. Now I'll spend a little bit of time at each level talking about how we've tried to mitigate some of the concerns uh, brought up by our community. So high school first. High school have an 8.20 start time. That's additional 70 minutes of sleep in the morning, an additional 40 to 60 minute later dismissal depending on the school from what their current dismissal is. Length of the day will be a common 7 hour and 10 minute day. That's a decrease between 10 and 30 minutes per day of time by school depending on which school it is. Uh, this is a conversation again of quality versus quantity and how we can make up some of that time and passing period but I, I have no trouble saying that a minute to two minutes less per period each day is well worth the time and the energy that students will get from sleeping longer and there will be much more quality that occurs in our classes. Teacher day for example that's a function administrative function and before school programming we are making the commitment that nothing new will exist in the morning. There's no reason to make this change if we just allow everything that occurs after school now to move before school. So currently things like uh, swimming, um, hockey, a few other things occur in the morning. Those will continue to occur in the morning, uh, but nothing new can be placed in the morning moving forward. Also, I'll mention that our high schools, uh, there are a few questions around students needing to get dropped off if they live near the boundary or too far to walk, parents have to get to work. Our high schools are typically always open. Um, but in the morning, we'll be open earlier for students to get dropped off by parents on the way to work if that supports their schedule. Looking at the middle school, 8.50 to 3.45. 8.50 start time adds 40 to 60 minutes of sleep in the morning depending on the school because their start times are different. 
3.45 p.m. dismissal time meets the earliest reasonable dismissal time as identified in the community survey, and we have before in the past dismissed at 3.35. Length of the school day will be a common six hour and 55 minute day, reduction of five minutes per school per day, so that at 26 seconds again, I believe is well worth the quality of instruction that can occur when students have rested. Teacher day, again, administrative function, but some examples of what that could look like. Student lunches, currently in our elementary schools that start at nine, some students eat breakfast as late as soon as, or lunch as soon as 10 o'clock. That will now shift to be our middle schools, that when students start at 8.50, some of our students will then eat quickly at 10 o'clock. Our middle schools will learn from our elementary schools and implement a formalized snack program in the afternoon. Uh, staff meeting will be adjusted. Morning time prior to school starting. This is a, a we see quite a few comments about the middle school in the morning that if my you know, first time sixth grade student, I have to get up and get to work and I don't know if they can wake themselves up, feed themselves, feed the dog and cat, lock the door, get to the bus stop and get to school on time as a sixth grader. So we will open up our middle schools starting at 8 a.m. with supervision where students can get dropped off. They can get in the cafeteria, have breakfast and finish homework, study in that type of environment that's safe, warm and they can eat. That is the current start time of our middle schools. So if parents need to drop students off on the way to work, there's no impact on their day. Athletics, 3.45 p.m. start. It is later than we currently have. However, we can be on time for it. So if you're a middle school parent or student right now and you uh, participated in track, you oftentimes would dismiss from school then have to sit around for 45 minutes to an hour waiting for the bus to come back after it cycled to get you to get you to the school of the competition. With a 345 dismissal, because we've already run our elementary routes first, we'll have more buses available at the middle school to not only take students home, but to take students to athletics and activities right away. So they won't be late anymore, they'll start on time. That will help with parent planning and leaving work. And with that later dismissal time, uh, can also support parents in getting to after school events or picking students up after school activities without having to leave work earlier. We will continue to run our facility shuttles. However, because we can move our staff meeting to Wednesday morning, we'll move that to a Monday through Thursday schedule with Friday off. I think everybody appreciates the opportunity to go home on time on Friday um, instead of the Wednesday. The elementary level, an 8 o'clock to 2.45 day. Elementary school starting at 8 a.m. is 60 minutes earlier than current. 2.45 dismissal is 45 minutes earlier than current. Length of the school day is a common six hour and 45 minute day. Additional 15 minutes per day, depending on the school, uh, can be used as either instructional time or athletic act or activity time, brain breaks, recess, however that may look at that individual site. And the reason I say some schools are, do have and continue to have two breaks, a lunch recess and a second recess slash brain break, uh, some schools only have one. So we wanna to look to all schools having those two opportunities for all kids around the district um, if you already have two, it's not going to be a third. It's going to be utilized instructional time. But that is the goal with that additional 15 minutes in the majority of our schools. As I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, some things to work through with our before and after care. Uh, we will reduce the cost um, in the morning because it's less time. Structure cost to support early and late pickup is currently done. So right now, if you pick up your student by 4.30, it's a discounted rate as opposed to the 6 o'clock time. We will continue that into the future to support parents that need to use daycare and some are modeling from past experiences in 8 o'clock start time. More parents can drop their student off at that 7.45, 7.50, 8 o'clock start time for elementary school on their way to work, thus eliminating the need for the before care in the morning. And we show that through our own data in the early 2000s. However, on the opposite side, we do show an increase in the aftercare, specifically the after school to the 4.30 time. And so we'll work on increasing opportunities there. And that does have an impact on our high school student employment, as I mentioned earlier. We're working with various opportunities through our high school and as we learn in Wayzata. Different opportunities for programs such as teacher cadets, executive internships, mutually listed assisted learning classes, um, child psychology classes. Also, if maybe somebody's uh, students employed in the Cherry Creek School District to support Cherry Creek School District kids, maybe that's the student that gets last period off on those days. And, and so we'll look at how we can support our kids both at the high school and the elementary school in that way. Staff meetings, we'll just move to the afternoon. Planning time does not change. Again, teacher day, administrative examples of um, things we'll have to finalize. A few other items, transportation. Again, the impact of the model. We add significant efficiencies by having elementary first. We use 100% of our buses and drivers for elementary and about 65% for each high school and middle school. And so running elementary first, and we have all of our buses on the road, they can then all go to high school, which we don't currently utilize all for high school, 
and then pick up students can have shorter routes, less crowded buses, and be more efficient in our system. We can also better support field trips, middle school athletics, as I su suggested, uh, joint campuses. Right now, some campuses have nine minutes between dismissal of high school and elementary and middle school students. This will have a common 15 minute gap, and so we'll help support students and parents. Uh, the civil twilight, we don't really need to utilize, but again, I just put it up there as something we learned from another high performing district. Athletics and activities. Elementary teachers will now have an opportunity to coach at the high school level, which they never, they haven't. Uh, more working professionals could coach. We also know this will have an impact on some of our middle school, current middle school coaches who may not be able to coach moving forward. Changes supported by our high school athletic directors. In fact, NFHS research added sleep supports athletic performance, Stanford basketball, as we heard from Dr. Meltzer earlier. And more officials will be available for competitions to start later in the day. So this actually could help what has been reported by Chassa with some of our shortage in officials for certain sports. That is the uh, recommendations regarding start time. The second part of this are some additional benefits that we could see based on our calendar, professional development, and start date because we're adding some time to our elementary school day. Specifically, that means reducing the number of pupil contact days per calendar year from 174 to 173 maintaining the 185-day teacher contract and repurposing that day to another staff development day. That supports the significant work of our teachers around the district and professional learning communities. And the second recommendation is to move the September professional development day to the first day back from winter break. This gives our teachers an opportunity to come back from a two-week break to have a day with each other, with their staff, and to prepare for students coming the next day instead of showing up the exact same day after two-week vacation that our students do. What this results in, if we took our current year's calendar, the one we're in right now, teacher workday started on the 5th, then 2nd, 3rd, and 4th teacher workday to the 10th, and students' first day was on the 11th of August, second day on the 12th, came back for their first full week on the 15th. If this was in effect this year, teacher work week would have started on the 8th, five workdays through the 12th, and the first day of students would have been on the 15th. That's an additional two weekdays, but four days of summer vacation for our families as we continue a conversation around the calendar and to be responsive to that conversation. The specific recommendations for next year's calendar would look like this, and these are posted in board docs for public review. This will be a, an associated resolution to the start times, um, but should not be considered or passed if the start time change is not considered or passed. So specifically for next year, right now the start time is on the 10th of August. That would move to the 14th, five full days for teachers. And then you can see the first day back in January would be a teacher day. End day still the same before the break, before Memorial Day. So we'd start later, end the same time, and have one move day there. For transitional, it'd be similar. We're talking about starting school on a Monday, having the same five days, and then ending in June. And the transitional calendar, as you know, has some differences to it. Um, but we have seven schools that are on that, so we add that to it. So if we look at all of this together, and what we really, what our kids, what our district gets from this, the school start times, it really becomes in alignment with best practice research. It's what's best for our kids. The budget is neutral. Transportation, we have a more successful transportation model. Works better for kids. Summer calendar, later start by two weekdays. And I can say that it works for, next, for a number of years. The calendar is always funny every once in a while, but it's always later by two weekdays. Professional development adds a full extra day of teacher professional development and a transition day back from winter break for staff. And we add activity time or active time, brain break, recess time at schools, the current elementary schools that currently only have the one break. Significant opportunity to better our students throughout the district. So questions of accountability and really outcome evaluation. How do we know, when will we know, how are we gonna hold ourselves accountable for this change? And so in, partnership, in partnering with National Jewish Health and Dr. Meltzer, we are working on looking at um, accountability in a few different ways. One, as you heard some of the studies here tonight, large group comparison between now and then. Survey students, staff, parents, and then look at a large meta-analysis of all of our, our, all of our data on students. Grades, performance, attendance, tardies, everything we can look at now versus everything we can look at a year from now. That's the type of study that's been done, and we want to do that as well. We also have some staff focus groups. 
now and again between a year from now for teachers, nurses, mental health. Get a group together, have a more of that anecdotal subjective conversation with them about differences between now and then with the change. Third, an all staff survey. And fourth, we're gonna ask for a volunteer-based, confidential longitudinal study that links parent and student survey responses with school performance factors over the next three years. So we wanna do this study that we weren't able to mention tonight, where we ask people to volunteer on a confidential basis for the next three years, parent and student take a survey of how this, impact is, how this is impacting them, affecting them, and then we purposely and confidentially link that survey to the student's performance data, grades, academics, uh, truancies, tardies, behavior, in every way forward so we can link on a one-to-one -one basis moving forward. This is the study that hasn't been done that can definitively answer even some of the questions that were brought up tonight. These are the four ways we want to hold ourselves accountable for this change and provide you, the board, and our community with evidence outcomes that it was a good change for our students moving forward. So finally, next steps. Where do we go from here? This is the formal recommendation. We will repost and communicate the 8 a.m. start time for elementary and the 8.20 start time for high school, as I shared. Uh, provide feedback opportunities uh, as we continue through our community up to the final recommendation. And then bring to you in March resolutions for action. And that meeting is Monday, March 11th, 2017. Resolution one will be the change in start times. And that's as I shared the recommendation tonight. Associated with that is the change in school calendar for 2017-18, which should only be considered if you vote to support the new change start times.